We've all heard of people who have used their children as pawns in a divorce. Maybe they're fighting over visitation or child support payments because they don't want to give their soon-to-be ex what they want. But in some extreme cases, the animosity and need for control can be destructive. Charles Vossler needed to be in charge. He needed to decide where his two sons, three-year-old CJ and two-year-old Billy, were at all times. So when it became clear that his marriage to his wife Ruth wasn't working out, Charles hatched a plan. On October 9, 1986, this plan culminated in him kidnapping his children and keeping them hidden for decades. Over the past 30 plus years, Ruth has never given up on her children. And at age 75, she is still out there fighting to keep their names and faces in the public eye in hopes of finally bringing them home. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of CJ and Billy Vossler. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. back everyone welcome back thank you thank you for joining us once again all right so i came across the story on tiktok of course of course but actually um i had heard of it before there i had listened to it on an episode of the unsolved mysteries podcast so i was familiar but there's a tiktok account called help ruth that is dedicated to getting cj and billy's story out there and I came across a post and uh, they were asking people to help share the story and help get the word out because Ruth is still actively fighting. And so I thought, I mean, hey, this is like literally what we're here to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I mentioned, Ruth is 75 now. CJ will turn 40 in just a few weeks and Billy is 38. They could have families of their own and be living their lives completely unaware that their mother has been searching for them since 1986. Before we get started, though, we've had a few amazing listeners join us over on Patreon. So we want to give a huge shout out to Melissa WM, Aaron G, and Christy M. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Thank you. But now let's get into the story of CJ and Billy Vossler. Charles Jason Vossler was born on December 9, 1982, to Charles and Ruth Vossler. The couple married in 1981 after meeting via a magazine ad in Mother Earth News. Wow, there is uh, so much to unpack there. Mother Earth News. Yes. And a magazine ad. Yes. So I don't know a lot about Mother Earth News specifically, but for, you know, the young people out there, like this was fairly common at the time. It was basically proto online dating. You know, people put classified ads in magazines and newspapers, and usually it was like part of a service. And there was an eight hundred number that you would call and leave like a voicemail if you were interested. And if the person who placed the ad liked the way you sounded or whatever, they would call you back, and you could like start corresponding or talking or whatever it was. Isn't that what that song, that one song is about? If you like pina colada. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's exactly what it's about, right? Yeah, exactly. At the time, Ruth was living in Wisconsin. And I'm not positive, but I think that Charlie was back in Rochester, New Hampshire. So they started corresponding and they corresponded for a while and then decided to meet. They ended up meeting and they married after about a year. That's quite a distance to go to just to meet somebody, though. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I'm not entirely sure where he was. I just know that she was in Madison, Wisconsin, because she uh, had moved there to attend college. Okay. 
So at all, she was like in her twenties when all this happened, and um, when all when they met, I mean, and Charlie was five years older. He had also apparently been married twice before. So after their wedding in 1981, they did end up settling in New Hampshire, where Charlie was originally from. They also went into business together, flipping houses. Charlie was very clear about wanting kids from the beginning, so he and Ruth were both thrilled when just about a year after they were married, CJ was born. Their happiness was doubled less than two years later when their second son, William Martin, came along on April 21st, 1984. The boys seemed to have the typical first versus second child personalities. CJ, the older one, was sweet and eager to please, and Billy (laughs) was more of a troublemaker. You know, obviously not a bad kid like he was too, but, you know, just like to push the envelope, like to push the buttons every now and again. But, you know, they were both just sweet, adorable kids and Ruth loved being a mom. Charles, on the other hand, loved the idea of being being a father. So he loved having sons and he played with the babies and, you know, enjoyed spending time with them. But when it came to the day-to-day duties and responsibilities of actually raising them, like many men of his generation, he left that to their mother. And keep in mind, so Charles was born in 1945. So he is straight up a boomer, like boomer central over here. Yeah, that's older than our dads. Yeah, exactly. Ruth had a lot to juggle. Not only was she raising two babies less than two years apart in age, but she was helping her husband with the house flipping business. The way that it seemed to work is that they would purchase a home in need of repair, move into it, and then complete the repairs and get it ready while they were living there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So then once it was ready, they would put it on the market, sell it, and then move on to the next one. I mean, it's not the worst way to make money for sure, but it definitely seems like more suited for a single person. Yeah, I was going to say that's got to be tough on the kids. Yeah, I mean, a family with two babies moving every, what, three, six months, whatever it was. I mean, that's rough. Moving and children are two of the top stressors in a marriage. So combining those two you know, that often, like, that's going to lead to some issues, no matter how strong the relationship may be. The problem was, Ruth and Charlie's relationship wasn't actually that solid in the first place. Oh, weird. (laughs) Yeah, shocker, right? After they were married for a while, Ruth started to notice things about Charlie's personality that, you know, she maybe wasn't fond of. Charlie definitely liked to be in charge, and, you know, he was the one who always had to make the decisions. Like, he had the final say. Even though he and Ruth were supposed to be in business together, he often failed to take her thoughts into consideration when making decisions. And yes, some of this was simply due to the fact that this was the early 80s, and a lot of marriages were set up this way. But when Ruth was kind of talking about some of the situations, it, it really does seem to have gone beyond that into just kind of weird behavior almost. So Ruth told the Unsolved Mysteries podcast that I mentioned that Charlie would do things that seemed to include her, like take her and the boys to go look at a potential property for them to buy and flip. Okay. Like, all of that sounds normal, right? And so then, you know, they'd be like in the car discussing it afterwards. And she said, well, what, you know, what do you think? Or should we buy this? And he'd be like, no, no, we're not going to buy this one. And then she would just find out later that he did go ahead and buy it. Mm, that's weird. Right? Like, what's what's the point of that, you know? So it, it was just kind of odd behavior like that. Ruth said that the final straw was when he decided to buy a house that she had strong objections to. Remember, you know, they couldn't just pick any old house that needed repairs. Like, they lived in this house. So it needed to be at least habitable. Right. And I'm sure his skills had limits as far as what he could do to rehab the house. Yeah. And I don't know how much 
he did, how much she did, how much they hired people to do, whatever it was. But yeah, like you couldn't just pick, you know, this falling down, like holes in the roof, foundation crumbling type of situation. Right, because then you're not going to get a return on investment. Yeah, and like that's not a place you want to live while you're fixing it up, you know? And so he found this one house and she's like, dude, we cannot move in. Like it just needs way, way too much work. And also more, more importantly, she didn't feel like it was a safe environment. I mean, she said that there were like nails sticking out of boards everywhere, you know, things that you don't want a two and a three year old around. Yeah. Now, unfortunately the deal was done. He bought it. So like, Her objections didn't end up really meaning much because it was already done. So they were stuck with it. But stuck with it or not, I mean, Ruth could not move her children into a dangerous situation. So they agreed that she and the boys would temporarily move into an apartment while, you know, they got the beginning stages of the work done on the house, basically while they just made it safe. The issues that Charlie and Ruth had in their marriage like weren't only relegated to the business and these houses. Charlie also had begun to develop a habit of staying out late or not coming home at all and not bothering to tell Ruth where he had been. And, you know, keep in mind, this is well, well before the era of cell phones. So when you were out of touch, like you were really out of touch. Yeah. I mean, you could just be dead in a ditch. You could be in Spain. Like, nobody knows. Ruth told Unsolved Mysteries that Charlie's parents were in Rochester for the summer, though it wasn't clear where they were staying. It also seems like they did live nearby. So I don't know if they just lived somewhere else in New Hampshire and they were staying in Rochester. Or I don't know. That part's a little fuzzy. But in any case... Charlie that summer, this is the summer of 86, would often choose to spend time with his parents, which is great, but not with his family, more instead of his family. You mean instead instead of his wife and kids? Yeah. Okay. So it's not like, oh, our parents are in town, ta- my parents are in town, you know, like, let's go visit them, let's bring the kids over, let's have them come over to the house. It was like, I'm just going to take off and go hang out with them. Like, I'll see you later. (laughs) Yeah, so clearly this is not a healthy marriage. Yeah, like none of it's great, right? Yeah. Now, it's also important to note at this point that Charles was clearly, seemingly, you know, extremely close to his parents. And they had been helping to bankroll the real estate business. Mm. So that's how he had afforded to start flipping these houses. Remember how at the top of the episode I said that Charles made a plan? Yeah. I believe that he set that plan in motion that summer with the purchase of that very dilapidated, unsafe house. So you think he bought it specifically because he knew it would trigger something in her? Yes. He knew Ruth and the boys couldn't safely live there. And it was a way to get her out of the house without her realizing the extent of what was going on. Mm. Interesting. So Ruth and the boys move into the apartment, but instead of Charlie like giving her her stuff or her like moving her things in there, he put it all into a storage unit. So, like, I think she had basic things like, you know, clothes and whatnot, but none of her personal possessions. And so I don't know if that had already been in storage from their previous move and he just didn't, like, give it to her when she moved into the apartment or or what really the deal was there. Yeah. But, um, you know, she would ask him, she's like, hey, can, like, you go to the unit and get some of my stuff and bring it over? And he would just make up excuses as to why he couldn't. Hmm. This obviously bothered her, but, you know, she wasn't incredibly worried because she saw all of this as a temporary situation. You know, she figured worst case scenario, like, once they got out of the apartment, they would just move all the stuff back into the house. Ruth doesn't say this explicitly, but I'm assuming that Charlie controlled all of their money and, 
even though she worked with him, she probably had an allowance. I mean, yeah, I think it's safe to assume that. Yeah. Given his already controlling temperament. Yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, that was fairly common for the time as well. That's true. That's true. I mean, keep in mind, like, we're talking 1986 by this point. They had been married since 1981. Women had only been able to have their own credit card since 1974. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. You didn't? No. Yeah. Before that, they had to have, like, their husband or father, like, co-sign for them. What the hell? Yeah, women were not legally allowed to have a credit card only in their name until 1974. Wow. Yeah, so like financial independence for women was not a huge thing, you know, even at this point, right? I mentioned that, you know, Ruth had gone to college in Wisconsin. By the time she and Charlie met, she had graduated and had started her career as a social worker. Once she got married and moved to New Hampshire, you know, like I said, she got pregnant pretty soon after. So she didn't pick it up, you know, after the marriage, she became a stay at home mom. Which I'm sure is what he wanted. Yeah. And she was perfectly fine with that as well. At this point in her life, she's living across the country from her family. You know, she's got two children very close in age together. Like, it's hard to you have a demanding job like that, right? You know, yeah. being a stay-at-home mom make, makes sense. And also, you know, she was helping with the business. But once she moved into the apartment, it seems as though Charlie wasn't really providing her with enough money to support herself and the boys. So she realized she needed to go back to work. However, Charlie didn't like the idea of her going back into social work because it was, quote, too involved and she wouldn't have enough time for the children, end quote. Which again, like that's those are conversations that they had had previous to her moving out. And like it made sense to her at the time, you know, early on. But now that she's out of the house, it's like, okay, but I actually do need a job now. And this is what I'm trained to do. Yeah. Nevertheless, she gave in and got a job at a fast food restaurant instead. While Ruth was at work, her niece would usually watch CJ and Billy. Everything was going along. I mean, not well, but it was going. Until one day, Charlie dropped a bombshell. He came over to the apartment and told Ruth that he had filed for divorce. Whoa. Yeah. Like, just like that, out of nowhere? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, clearly they weren't in the most blissful marriage, but like, just... That's it. I'm done. Yeah. Like, not only I'm done, but I'm done and the paperwork has already been filed. Damn. And again, yeah, like Ruth wasn't blissfully happy, like you said, but, you know, divorce was not in her near future plans by any means. She was looking at the separation as temporary and more logistical right. than anything else. Than like an actual like separation, separation from the marriage. Exactly. And Charlie clearly had other ideas and had for some time. So when he shows up to the apartment and tells her this, Ruth panics, of course, and immediately asks about custody because that was her main concern. You know, if you're going to divorce me, like, what is your plan for these kids? And Charlie gave her the most bullshit response possible. He told her that he just, he couldn't remember what he had put in the documents about that. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's uh, like, oh yeah, custody. Th- I know I said something in the divorce. Yada, yada. Just don't, I just, it completely slipped my mind. Wow. Yeah. And then she's like, oh, okay. Well, who's your lawyer? I mean, I'm sure we can get a copy of the documents. And he goes, you know, oh, gosh, I just don't remember his name either. Okay. Like, come on. Yeah. Bullshit. I mean, it's pretty bad, right? Wow. And obviously, you know, Ruth is a smart lady and she's like, okay, well, this is obviously not good. So she immediately went and got her own attorney. Good. They both had attorneys. Uh, Charlie, you know, apparently eventually remembered who his was. <laughs> and they started working toward a legal custody agreement. 
But in the meantime, they kind of just had to work it out on their own. Charlie decided that he didn't want Ruth's niece to watch the boys while she was at work. And, you know, he said that he could do it. And that's all well and good. But he would usually just drop them off with his parents instead. Ruth may not have liked this, but unfortunately, there wasn't much she could do about it at that point. You know, it's his parents, it's the kids' grandparents. Like, he wasn't putting them in a dangerous situation or anything that would be actionable. Like, what is she going to do? Go to the judge and say, like, he won't let my niece watch the kids. He's making their grandparents watch him. Like, right. yeah. that's not extremely compelling. No. So this whole thing went on for a few months. Charlie would often return the boys late, but other than that, they stuck to the informal agreement that they had worked out. October 9th, 1986 was a Thursday. It was Charlie's weekend with the boys, and he was taking them that day. The original plan was for them to stay local and, you know, maybe go visit his parents or whatever. So Ruth handed off her sons that day and went to work. Charlie later called her and said, that he was going to take the boys to visit his aunt in Connecticut and would be a little bit late for their scheduled drop-off that Saturday. And I don't know if by a little bit late he meant later on Saturday or if he meant he was just going to keep them until Sunday. Mm -hmm. But either way, like he called and said, hey, plans have changed. I'm going to have the boys a little bit longer. Now, I don't know where in Connecticut his aunt lived, but Connecticut and New Hampshire are two states away from each other. And so roughly about three hours by car, give or take. Like I said, again, based on where she lived in the state, though, New Hampshire, Connecticut are not large states. No. So we're talking about three hours. So like, yes, another state, but definitely a reasonable destination for a weekend trip. Mm -hmm. So again, Ruth didn't love this idea, but there just really wasn't a whole lot she could do about it. Saturday, October 11th came, and Charlie did not return with her children. Sunday came and went, and there was no word. By Monday morning, Ruth was obviously concerned, but it actually sounds like she was kind of more angry than frantic. She just thought that Charlie was basically being a dick, you know, not that he had done something to the kids. Right. So she still hadn't heard from them, though, by Monday, and she decided to go down to his office and see, you know, what the hell he had to say for himself. Like, she fully expected him to be at work, and the boys were with, like, his parents or whomever, and they were going to have it out. But when she arrived, she saw that the office was closed, and the business was gone. I find it interesting that they're living in houses that they're flipping, but he has an office? <laughs> and employees, apparently, like, which is funny because you're right. That's not ever, that's not something I ever really thought about. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like that part is kind of a waste of money. Like, maybe you should buy a house for your family <laughs> instead of having, you know, employees in your office. Yeah. I don't know. You're right. I mean, that's a good point. But yeah, it's definitely not something that occurred to me. Anyway. But yeah. Anyway, he did have employees and an office and it was all gone. So she's standing there like going, what the hell is happening? And as she's there, a man comes out of the office holding a box and he says, oh, yeah, Charlie sold his business over the weekend and laid everyone off with no notice. Wow. It was then that Ruth knew Charlie was not coming back with her children. Yeah. So this is clearly like he's been planning this for a while. Like you don't just sell a business over the weekend. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I mean. He yes. did, but <laughs> he didn't just decide right, to sell yes. the business over the weekend. Yeah. 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 And it gets even crazier. So Ruth managed to drive to her attorney's office before completely breaking down. While she was there, she called Charlie's parents to see what they knew. But they were, of course, just completely shocked. Oh, yeah. Right. And had no idea what was going on. Uh-huh. 
Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to make light of this by comparing it to a movie, but remember the end of The Usual Suspects? Spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen this 25-year-old movie. Uh, Yes. So when Chaz Palminteri is looking around after Kevin Spacey leaves and sees all the things around the office that he pulls from in order to make his story up, like that's what this feels like to me. Ruth knows at this point that she needs to file a missing persons report and that in order to do so, she needs pictures of the boys to give to the police. Uh Now, again, we are decades before the era of digital photos. So any photos that people had were either like in physical photo albums or in shoe boxes, basically. But getting a hold of those photos wasn't as easy as going back to her apartment and grabbing them because Charlie had put all of her possessions into that storage unit. Oh, yeah. So she had to go over there. So she headed over, planning to dig through the unit to find the photos of the boys to give to the police. But when she arrived, she found that the storage unit was completely empty. Damn, this dude was thorough. Mm Mm-hmm. Not only that... Ruth soon discovered that Charlie had taken her name off of the credit card that they had shared and took all of the money out of their checking account. Ruthless. But he didn't do that right before he left. Like, that's not something he did, you know, Friday or whatever. That checking account is the one that her car payment came out of. And she later found out that the last two payments hadn't been made. So by the time she even figured out what was going on, she was already in danger of losing her car. And she knew that he had been planning this whole thing for at least that long. Yeah. Charlie also took every stick of furniture that they had owned. But beyond that, just to add insult to injury, he even took the Bible that Ruth's grandmother gave her for her confirmation. Wow. Yeah. This guy's a piece of work. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. The only like traces of her children that she had, you know, other than like whatever clothes and toys that she had at her apartment, were um, she was able to track down like their baptism certificates. Like, I don't think she even had their birth certificates, just their baptism certificates. So with her life falling apart around her, Ruth thought back to some other possible clues. Prior to her moving out, Charles had started isolating her from family and friends. When people would call her, he would just tell them that she was unavailable and hang up. That's classic manipulator behavior. Then there was the time just recently when she went by his house and saw that his beloved horse was gone. When she asked him about it, Charlie said that he had sold it to a neighbor, but he loved that horse and he never would have just sold it. Unless he was planning on not being there. Exactly. Ruth began to realize that this was not a rash decision that Charlie had made. Getting her out of the house, taking her possessions, her money, not allowing her to return to her career, isolating her from her friends, selling his possessions and his business. It was all an intricate plan put in place to make sure that Charlie could escape with CJ and Billy and Ruth would have very few resources with which to find him. But Ruth had to try. She went to the Rochester police with no photos and tried to report her boys missing. Again, this is 1986, and her children were taken by their father, so you can imagine how far she got with that. Yeah, nowhere. Yep. You know, the biggest problem was that Ruth and Charlie weren't divorced, so there was no custody agreement in place. And especially in 1986, with no photos of the children, like police weren't exactly going to put this case at the top of their list. The Parental Kidnapping Prevention Act went into effect in 1980, but despite its name, it wasn't actually helpful in this situation. It had more to do with states' rights and jurisdictions than helping get children back in situations like this. 
basically, um, the act just says that if you live in like one state, you can't just take the kids to a different state that may rule more favorably toward you. So if you live in one state, but you think the state next door would like make you just pay less child support, you can't just take your kids there and like say you live there now. That's really all that was. Didn't really offer her much help. Even more than that, at the time, the general perception of parental kidnapping, both with the public and law enforcement, was that it wasn't really even a crime. The idea that these people had was that the children were taken out of love and were likely safe, so it wasn't really an emergency. And that's something that Ruth has said over the years that she has constantly had to deal with. So, you know, it was very prevalent, you know, of course, when this first happened, because that's what the Rochester police originally told her. They're like, we don't really handle kidnappings and we definitely don't care about like parental kidnappings. But that's what people would say to her over the years, you know, many of them well-meaning be like, oh, well, at least they're with their father. And she's like, listen, yeah, but her their father is obviously not a nice guy. Exactly. So she's like, he didn't take them out of love. He took them out of revenge. Like, right. I don't know that they're safe. I hope that they're safe. But clearly I missed a bunch of shit with this guy like i don't know what's going on and even on one of the tiktok videos in the year of our lord 2022 put well it's not really kidnapping when it's the parent it's like are you kidding me so i mean clearly this is still a major issue and it's something she's been dealing with for over 30 years During those crucial beginning days and weeks and months, Ruth was virtually on her own. About six weeks later, from what I have been able to find, she was able to track down a video that a co-worker had taken at a company picnic. The co-worker had panned over CJ and Billy, so they took stills from that video, and that's what they used for the missing posters. We're talking video stills from, you know, the early 80s. Yeah, definitely not the best quality. No, not the best quality. And since then, they've been cleaned up and they look a lot better than they did. But still, I mean, you it's not shocking that a ton of leads didn't start pouring in, you know. And also, like this was months after the disappearance that they even got this. Right. Most of the first year passed with no real clues as to Charlie's whereabouts. When he didn't return, police did eventually charge him with custodial interference. A federal warrant was issued for his arrest, but it wasn't exactly a manhunt. And Charlie had covered his tracks pretty well. We just re-released our, you know, two episodes on Sage Smith, and we talk about cases where, like, Eric McFadden, the main suspect in her disappearance has been missing, but I question how missing he actually is. I just don't think that anybody's tried super hard to find him. Yeah. But this is not that. Like, this guy really hid. I mean, he's smart. He had resources. He knew what he was doing. Ruth eventually moved back to Wisconsin to be near her family, and she continued her search from there. Now, NICMAC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, had been founded in 1984, but it wasn't the powerhouse that it is today. Not many states had their own missing children's organizations either. So Wisconsin, where she moved back to, didn't, for instance. So it was an organization in Minnesota that helped her get flyers out and offered her some support. Time passed and Ruth tried to live her life, but continued to devote most of her energy to finding her boys. Then finally, in 1988, she received the first real lead in the case. In August of 1988, nearly two years after she had last seen her ex-husband and her sons, a woman from Stillwell, Oklahoma, called Ruth out of the blue. She said that she had been having a relationship with Charles 
Vossler, except he was going by the name of Charles Wilson. She went on to describe Charlie and her two children perfectly, and Ruth believed her story. So what happens next? You're going to shit yourself. So Ruth alerts authorities, and by this point, the FBI is involved. Okay. But it takes them four days to follow up. (laughs) Uh, Why? I don't know. They had other things to do, I guess. So they mosey on down there. Four days later, and what do they find? Nothing. Well, they found something. They found that the home that Charlie and the boys had been living in had been burned to the ground. Oh, wow. He went to that extreme. Yep. So uh, clearly he found out that uh, that this woman ran yep. him out. Yeah, he got tipped off. Damn. Burned the house and bounced. Shit. After this devastating near miss, Ruth spoke with people in Stillwell who had known Charlie, and most weren't even aware that he had had children. She told the Portage Daily Register that year, quote, almost all of them had never seen the children. We know that the life of an abducted child is one of isolation. Abducted children don't get to go out and play, end quote. But the woman that he was involved with had seen the kids. Yes. So uh, it sounds like a few people had. She said that most knew, like, didn't know that he had kids. But it sounds like, you know, obviously that woman did and probably a few other people. After nearly getting caught in Oklahoma, Charlie seemingly went even deeper underground. According to Ruth, he was adept at living off the grid, could easily charm people and spoke multiple languages. All of this has contributed to him being able to not only keep himself and the boys hidden, but to seemingly not make anyone suspicious in all of these years. Let's not forget, though, that Charlie did have some help, at least initially. Ruth was eventually able to locate some credit card bills and receipts that indicated that Charlie's father, Charles Sr., had helped Charlie escape with the boys. Shocker. Right? What a twist. She told the Unsolved Mysteries podcast that her ex-father-in-law confessed to actually traveling with Charlie, CJ, and Billy for the first few weeks. They drove through New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Charlie's mother, Blanche, allegedly stayed behind to tie up the sale of the real estate business, as well as Charlie and Ruth's home. Funnily enough, Ruth didn't actually get any of the proceeds of that sale because Prior to all this, the uh, deed had been put in the parent's name. The FBI was able to interview Charles Sr. and Blanche once, but they stopped cooperating after that initial interview. Ruth was able to speak with Charles Sr. one other time, you know, many years later, it sounds like. And he told her that he had seen Charlie twice after those initial two weeks. Once in South America and another time at a train station in Stuttgart, Germany. What the hell? This story is bananas. I know, I know. And it seems kind of crazy to to our brain because it's like, how did this guy get to South America and to Stuttgart? Both of these sightings were well before September 11th, 2001, when it was a lot easier to travel internationally with limited documentation. So it's definitely not... Outside of the realm of possibility. Yeah, no, it, it just, it, this shit. I know. Sounds like a movie. That's what it sounds like. That's what it's, it sounds like to the beginning. I mean, when she goes and the, the business is closed and the storage room is empty and her money's got like, holy shit, man. This guy, this is not your typical, like... Yeah, was he, was he like, side business a spook for the CIA? I mean, Jesus, who knows? Maybe South America, maybe Germany, but neither Ruth nor authorities are really sure of how much stock to put into these statements made by Charlie's parents. Yeah, like maybe that they said that to throw authorities off or whatever. Well, exactly, right? Like, who knows, you know? She wants to believe it because, like, 
apparently he kind of implied that the boys were also there when he saw Charlie. And, you know, that means that... Proof of life. Exactly, right? So, like, that's definitely a better scenario than others for her, right? Unfortunately, though, no more information will be forthcoming from either of Charlie's parents. Blanche passed away in 2010, and Charles Sr. followed in 2014. Whatever other knowledge they may have had about CJ and Billy's whereabouts were taken to their graves. As for Ruth, once she moved back to Wisconsin, she resumed her career as a social worker. In the mid-90s, she moved to North Carolina and got remarried. Though Ruth never gave birth to more children, her new husband had kids already, so she became a stepmother and then a grandmother. Good for her. Yeah. She retired as a social worker in 2014 and was asked to work with the National Support Group for Missing and Exploited Children. Ruth still dreams of finding her boys and wonders what they're like today. She, of course, hopes that they've grown up to be happy, healthy adults, though she does worry that being raised by their father left emotional damage. She actually has had um, a private investigator who's been helping her since the 80s, like almost the entire time. He's actually like the husband of one of her old co-workers, and he was also on the Unsolved Mysteries podcast, and you know he talks about how his belief is that Charlie is a malignant narcissist and, you know, he can be very charming, but ultimately nobody's more important to him than himself. And he sees the boys as possessions and typical narcissist stuff. So it's like on one hand, it is his father and hopefully he has kept them safe and they did grow up to lead relatively normal lives. But on the other hand, nobody knows. Ultimately, Ruth hopes that her boys get curious about where they came from and decide to submit their DNA to, you know, one of the databases. Ruth and several of her family members have submitted theirs already, just hoping for a match. Ruth told the Colfax Messenger in 2015, quote, This is something a mother never stops thinking about. Sometimes it feels like they were taken just yesterday, and sometimes it feels like a lifetime ago. To me, they are still three and two years old, but then I remember they are grown men now. I hope and pray every day someone sees the new photos and comes forward with information. Not knowing what happened to my children is the worst feeling in the world, and I need to know where they are. End quote. So that's why we did this episode. So we can help get their story out there. We can help get their names and their faces out there. You know, we're going to be posting their photos all over our blog and social media accounts. Age for guest photos also? Yeah, they have several. So we're going to be putting all of those out there. Oh, and that's the other thing I found. In around 2016, after Charlie's parents died, an anonymous source finally found some photographs of CJ and Billy and sent them to Ruth. And so now there are a few. They're not super recent. They're, you know, a few years before they went missing, but they're at least actual photos of the little boys. So we'll have those up as well. Hmm. I wonder who that was. I mean, I'm guessing somebody in Charlie's family who yeah. felt safe to do it after the parents passed away. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Somebody was willing to do that anonymous, anonymously in 2016. Maybe somebody's willing to make some anonymous statements in 2022. If somebody is out there who still knows something, Ruth is all ears. Charles Martin Vosler kidnapped his children and fled Rochester, New Hampshire on October 9, 1986. He may have used the last name Wilson, Foster, or Amidon. He is a white male with brown hair and blue eyes. He was six foot one and approximately 225 pounds. 
He has a condition called nystagmus, which is a rapid eye movement in a horizontal fashion. He was 44 at the time of the abduction. He would be 80 today. CJ Vossler is a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes. He was three foot four and approximately 40 pounds. CJ was three years old at the time of his disappearance. He would be 39 today. Billy Vossler is a white male with brown hair and blue eyes. He was three feet tall and approximately 36 pounds. He was two years old when he went missing. He would be 38 today. There's a $25,000 reward offered to anyone who can provide information leading to the location of Charles Vossler, CJ, or Billy. If you have any information, please contact your local FBI field office, your local American embassy or consulate, or the Rochester, New Hampshire police at 603-335-7529. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production.